Okay, now they can hear me. Okay, so as I was saying, welcome to the stream where everything is going wrong so far. Um, today, <laughs> we are trying to talk about uh, shaders with Roman. Uh, now, you've probably seen Roman around before, also here. Um, I will have to apologize in advance if some things don't work. Uh, literally nothing was working. Uh, it took us some time. It took me some time uh, to get some stuff sorted. So if something doesn't work, please do let me know in the chat. I will try and fix them as we go. Um, that said, Ivan, Roman, welcome. Uh, sorry, everyone, we had to take a break uh, last week. We were uh, at DroidCon London, and uh, next week we're also on a break because I am going to be uh, in London again for uh, Android Dev Summit. Uh, but after that, we're going to be on a run until the end of the year, and we have some really exciting stuff planned for you. Uh, Roman, I don't think you need to introduce yourself, uh, but maybe you want to do a brief intro to the topic of today. I'll also introduce myself. Sure. Not everybody in this room knows who I am. Uh, so I I'm doubt it. <laughs> so I'm Roman D, and I'm the, uh, the lead for the Android Talk team at Google. Uh, so we work on Jetpack and Google System and Jetpack controls. Uh, Okay. <laughs> Hopefully it's going to be fine, but who knows? I see the levels fine on OBS, so I, I honestly have no no clue. I'm gonna I, I have a suspicion. Yep, yeah, it did the same thing. Okay, now you you should be able to hear them. Uh, Can you I think hear me now? OBS did the thing where it muted the tracks without telling me. Ah, the stay on your uh, toes uh, setup that yep. you have every now and then. Yep. Okay. 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 Sorry, Roman. Can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so hi, I'm Romagi, I lead the Android Toolkit team at Google, and today we're going to talk about uh, shaders, uh, which have been on Android for a long, long time, but now they are more easily accessible to app developers. Uh, so we're going to see how you can use them from Compose. Uh, and then if we have time, which I hope so, we can talk some more about shaders, like some best practices on how to write shader code, and some examples of like, cool things you can do uh, with shaders. Fantastic, fantastic, mm. fantastic. It's going to be cool. Um, I'm so excited. Yeah, well, I've been looking forward very, to very this excited. for a while now. <laughs> so uh, how do we want to do this, Sebastiano? Do we want to start with questions? Uh, Roman, so, do you have an introduction that you want to give? Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, maybe we should start with explaining what shaders are uh, and more specifically, which shaders we are talking about. Um, so shaders, and I'm going to try to keep things, you know, at a fairly high level, um, but shaders are programs that you can run on a GPU uh, as opposed to, you know, the typical code you write that runs on the CPU. Now, shaders are interesting because there are many types of shaders in, a, in modern, uh, modern GPUs. So let's see, if I remember them all, you have vertex shaders, fragment shaders, uh, geometry shaders, tessellation shaders, compute shaders, and mesh shaders or meshlet shaders. And I think I got them all. 
Um, so when we talk about shaders in the context of uh, Compose or the view system, what we mean is fragment shader, and another name for that is uh, colloquially uh, pixel shaders. Uh, we talk about fragment shader, I'm not going to go into the details because technically when you're uh, generating a pixel with a fragment shader, you're not generating the final pixel, you're generating a fragment, but you know that's details about GPUs uh, that we won't get into. Um, and so, so when you write a pixel shader, like I said, it's a program that runs on the GPU, and you use a dedicated programming language called the shading language, and there are a bunch of them. Uh, the two most common ones nowadays are HLSL, uh, which is the shading language that came from DirectX, so the, from Microsoft. And the other one is GLSL, which were well, technically uh, also called ESSL on, on mobile. And that's the shading language that came from OpenGL. Uh, and when you use, oh, and Metal on iOS and Mac has something called Metal SL or MSL. Uh, and then when you use modern graphics APIs like Vulkan, uh, Vulkan does not have a shading language. It has a, a kind of like a bytecode. Uh, so you can use pretty much any language you want to target Vulkan. But again, in the context of Android, we're going to use something called AGSL for Android Graphic Shading Language, which is derived from SKSL, which is the Skia shading language, uh, which is itself a variant of GLSL. <laughs> So I, I hope it's, it starts making sense. Uh, what's interesting about shading languages is that they're much more limited than your typical programming language, especially something like Kotlin. Uh, so for instance, you, you have structures, but you cannot allocate memory. You can only put things on the stack. There's no heap. You can't do like new you know, class. Uh, you don't have the only primitive types you, you have are scalars, so they are integers, floats, uh, booleans. Sometimes you don't always have booleans, but you don't have things like you know strings. They don't exist. Uh, so they are very limited languages, but they also have features that are very specific to the problem of running code on a GPU. Uh, and we'll see some of those features. So you have like first-class support for vectors and matrices uh, and swizzling and things like that. So we're going to see that in our examples. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting about, about those, those, uh, the, the pixel shaders is the context in which, in which they're, they're, they're run. Um, when, when you render something with the GPU, you, know, you start from triangles and all that stuff, and for every pixel that the GPU wants to rasterize, it's going to invoke your pixel shader. So your, your program is going to be invoked potentially millions of times for every pixel that, that you're touching. Uh, and when you execute the program, you're kind of like blind and memoryless. So you, you have some inputs. Uh, like I said, you cannot allocate memory, but you only have effectively one output. Uh, you can output the current pixel, and that's it. Um, so traditionally, on the CPU, let's say you want to draw a circle, what you would do is you, you would run an algorithm. You know, you have the, the equation of the circle. You would figure out like, okay, what pixels do I need to like set in my bitmap to draw that circle? You cannot do that with a pixel shader, right? Like it works the other way around, where for every pixel you're gonna you're gonna have to write a program that asks itself, "Am I in the circle?" And if I'm in the circle, wow, yeah, okay. it's a. Uh, sometimes you'll hear the term scatter and gather. Uh, so you know, if you draw a circle on the CPU, you tend to scatter the work. So you're gonna like touch all the pixels you need, and on the GPU, it's the other way around. You gather the work uh, for the current pixel. So it's a different way of thinking. Uh, it makes some algorithms super easy to write. It makes other algorithms extremely hard to write. Uh, for instance, just doing just sorting an array uh, can be complicated uh, on the GPU because you don't have access necessarily to like all the data you need. So th there are ways of thinking about it. Um, but but that's the, the, what you have to understand. You know, before you write pixel shaders for for compose or views, is that right? Like you're going to have this little program that's going to run for every pixel that your composable or your view or your drawing primitive is touching. And you're going to have some inputs. You can set some of those inputs. Uh, and the main input you're going to get that's built in is the current coordinate of the pixel on screen. Uh, and it leads to very interesting code to write where just based on the pixel coordinate, you try to figure out, like, like I said, am I in a shape? Where am I in the gradients? Uh, how much do I need to blur this? 
so it's a yeah very very different way of thinking about it. Uh, and then when you when you go into the the details, the way GPUs execute code is very different from a CPU, um, and they follow. And again, I'm I'm sim I'm oversimplifying it, but they follow what's called a, a sim T model, not D T. Um, so your your CPU has a lot of your GPU has a lot of cores, and a lot of and all those cores have multiple threads. So it's gonna like I said, it's gonna run the pixel shader for every pixel on screen, right? So it could be millions of times. So the goal of the GPU is to run as many of those pixels in parallel as it can. But it's not like the same the threads that you have on the CPU. The way the GPU works is it's gonna take what's called a, a, a batch. Often you'll hear the terms like wave or warp. So it's going to take a batch of pixels, let's say 16, uh, and it's going to spawn like 16 threads, so hardware threads, but it's going to run the same program on all those threads at the same time. So the same instruction will run on all those threads at the same time, kind of in lockstep, um, which leads to interesting side effects where like if you have branches in your code and you have two threads that are not doing the same thing, well, if one of those threads like is doing more work, the other th threads kind of are waiting for it to be done because they have to move in lockstep. Um, so again, very different model. And then on top of that, because GPUs are really designed to do like fast graphics rendering, um, they have really cool hardware dedicated to math. So even on mobile, you could do things like you could add and multiply together ve like vectors of four floats and take the absolute value of the result and multiply the result by, by two. And you can do that in like one cycle uh, on the CPU, it will take many, many cycles. Um, so again, very different way of, of thinking about things. Hopefully with the kind of shaders you will write, you won't have to worry too much about it. Uh, but you, know, you also have to be careful because especially on Android, there's a wide array of GPUs, and some of them are high end, and some of them are low end. Uh, and you know, if you care about performance, you may want to test everywhere because it's easy to uh, to write code that would be slow. Uh, and and of course, like the other thing you can do with GPUs that's kind of bad is like if you write a somewhat infinite loop, uh, you can more or less lock up the device uh, because. It's not a CPU, like we can't interrupt those threads. They have to do their work and, and be done. Um, so yeah. Uh, so that's so, the context uh, for No shaders. big deal. <laughs> yeah. Any questions so far? <laughs> we have a bunch. I actually have one. Uh, I know it's a silly, a silly question, but what is the reason why uh, we are using a, like a very similar but separate language from uh, for for shaders on Android from uh, SkiSL and GLSL. Yeah, so AGSL is actually just the same thing as as SkiSL. Uh, it's just you know a marketing name that made more sense uh, for Android developers because not everyone is aware that Skia uh, is underneath mm. the Canvas API. So that was really just to make things a little you know easier to grasp uh, for most developers. Um, so the reason it's different is because. GLSL has a lot of features that kind of only make sense when you connect your pixel shader to other things like the vertex shaders or mm. because you can pass data between the vertex shader and the pixel shader. But we don't do that uh, in, in our APIs. So it's it's kind of a restricted form of GLSL in many ways. Um, and, and, and then it adds a couple of features that are just very specific to Skia and Android, but that, that, that are nice. Um, and we'll see one of them actually uh, in the example that we're, we're so, going to write together. The, uh, they've also added a couple of like small syntactic sugar that I really enjoy and I wish that was in GLSL. So, so the, the horrible comparison that I, I am going to make is uh, AGSL and uh, SkiSL are to uh, GLSL like uh, Visual Basic for applications is to VB6. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a, it was mostly a joke. I hope it yeah. has nothing to do with VBA. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. It's it's very different. W one more thing <laughs> I need to add, uh, and and you're all gonna hate it, and or, or maybe it will make you feel better about you know because uh, you know we always complain about our compilers, about our IDs, about all that stuff. Uh, GPUs are not general purpose uh, uh, processing units, um, so the shader compilers 
tend to be pretty horrible in terms of error re reporting. So thankfully, the, the Skia compiler is slightly better. Uh, but sometimes, you know, you, you have very little to go by in terms of errors. Um, there's no debugger. Uh, you cannot do printf. Uh, but you can make you cannot... pixels right, right? <laughs> yeah, all you can do is, you know, in your code, you add a condition. You say, oh, if this condition, then, you know, mark the pixel like purple and it gives me some information about what's going on. Mm. Uh, so it's a, <laughs> it can be challenging. Uh, but thankfully, like, be because the technology of pixel shaders is, is common to like all platforms, there are playgrounds that you can use online. Like Skia has a playground so you can test your shaders online. You don't have to do it inside your app. Uh, so there are, there are ways around it. But like, yeah, the tooling store is not, as good as it is uh, for CPUs, uh, especially on Android. Uh, so hopefully it will get better over time, but just know that it can be, it can be real challenging. Um, so yeah, uh, any other questions about like the nature of pixel shaders and how things work? Um, maybe one uh, just asked by someone, which is uh, if is a GSL supported only on Android 13 and later? Yeah, so AGSL is only on Android 13 and later because it needs support from Skia, the view system, the render node, and the display list system. So you can hook up those shaders to views uh, and, and composables. Uh, and I think that, yeah, there's another question about uh, OpenGL. Mm -hmm. But but if, if what you're trying to do is just image processing, you, you don't have to use AGSL. Uh, AGSL, you can think of it as, it's a very easy, very convenient way of doing you know, shaders, but you can do it yourself with OpenGL. Uh, it requires writing a lot more code. You have to go learn OpenGL a little bit. It's more complicated. Uh, you know, it's gonna be harder to ingest some of the data from the view system into OpenGL uh, because a lot of that stuff is taken care of for you uh, by, by AGSL and, and the rendering pipeline. Uh, so it really depends on what you're trying to do. Got it. So we are, uh, I think we have probably exhausted most of the starter questions. Uh, we have the big, big question that we will maybe get at the end of the stream. It's a, a question in five parts, uh, actually in six, seven parts, sorry. It says seven out of five at the end, so. Yeah, and that question, I think, yeah, we'll start answering it as we start writing some code. Yeah, it will make more sense as we go further in. Do you yeah. want to start um, sharing your screen? Well, I, I can show your screen and we can start yeah, coding some. Yeah, let's, let's do that. OK. Code. OK, so what are we starting with now? All right, uh, so I, I simply created a new project uh, in Android Studio. All I did was add a, a, a drawable, like I have a bitmap uh, that I load here uh, that we're going to use. Uh, otherwise, you know, nothing fancy. We have a, a, a material surface and a column. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to create an image composable uh, using that image. And we're going to apply a shader uh, to that image so that we can do something interesting that you suggested, uh, Seb. So we're going to do a chromatic aberration effect where on the edges of the image, we want to start seeing like blue and red fringing uh, that you may have seen. It's popular in video games and you may have seen it in... in Unfortunately video popular in video games. Unfortunately popular in video games. It's <laughs> one of the things where used well, it can be really good, uh, but it tends to be overused. Um, so yeah, we're going to do that. Uh, <laughs> so first step, we need our image. Um, let's see, uh, oh, to import it, uh, which one? Okay. Oh, just FYI, because you're sharing a window, we cannot see the pop up. So okay. Well, they're not very interesting, right? Like the other code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Code. just FYI. <laughs> yeah. Where I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, which image do I want to uh, do I want to import? Uh, content description. We're gonna leave that empty. All right. So an easy way to set a shader on a composable is to go through modifiers. Uh, so we're gonna create a modifier. Let's see. Uh, yeah, type of. The, yeah, and the, the modifier that lets you uh, set a shader on a composable is the graphics layer. Uh, so, okay. And we'll 
Oh, I need to import. Uh, uh, you have a typo there. Oh, yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, I just uh, so the graphics layer modifier is the equivalent to what used to be the uh, graphics layer attribute in views, or does it have uh, nothing to do? So <laughs> in typical <laughs> fashion, yes and no. Uh, so a graphics player is more like a render node or display list uh, in the view system. So it's really because Compose under the hood will use render nodes and display list, but it's um, it's going to decide when it uses one of them. And graphics layer is a way to tell Compose, OK, I know what I'm doing. I want to effectively record all those commands inside mm. the render node, uh, and I want you to reuse that as much as possible. Now, graphics layer layers, they also add features that were on view, but that internally were on render nodes. So things like the alpha, so opacity, scale, rotation, translation, you can set them directly on the graphics layer. Mm. So graphics layer are also a way to apply transforms uh, to a composable. Now, there's yet another thing they can do, and that's why I answered also yes to your question. Uh, layers in the view system are what we would call composition layer or raster layers. So what they were doing is they would take the content of the view render it into a bitmap or a texture, and then we would have this basically screenshot uh, that we could reuse uh, over and over. So it's very efficient to render on the GPU, and you can also apply like you know blending effects and so on. So you can do that with a graphics layer. And actually, that's what happens when you do, for instance, alpha equals 0.9999F. Uh, because the alpha is not one, mm. this has the magical side effect of rasterizing uh, <laughs> your composable into a layer. The good news is, as of yesterday, I was informed that internally we added a new API. So instead of doing this, uh, there's going to be a new attribute, a new property where you can say, please turn this into a raster layer. Ah, nice. So it's not a side effect anymore, but it's just uh, have to be explicit. It will be a side effect still, but but if you want, like, if you don't want to change the alpha, you know, if you want. To oh, alpha, okay. So yeah, you'll be able to you'll be able to say like, just give me. The, you know, this composable as a, as a texture. Okay, it's not a hack anymore, essentially. Yeah, but so what we want to, so, but today what we want to use, the, we want to use another property called render effect. Um, so render effect, our effects are new as of Android 12, I believe. Uh, ah, my indents are off and I hate that. Um, <laughs> so let's see. And you have a bunch of render effects you can create. Uh, so I don't think you see my pop-up, but uh, you can create a bitmap effect, a blur effect, a blend mode effect. There's a bunch of them. The one we want uh, right now is the... No, I'm not going to do blur. I'm looking at the chat. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to use uh, we're gonna use some, something called a runtime shader effect. Uh, so runtime shader is a horrible name because we already have something called shaders um, in in Skia uh, and since Android 1.0. And it's funny because shaders, uh, so things like bitmap shader or linear gradient, are exactly pixel shaders as we talked about. You know, we talked about them, they were just under the hood, actually, when we move Skia to the GPU, that's how they are implemented, they're, they're pixel shaders. Uh, but in this case, we want, we're going to program our own shader. So the name runtime shader came about. Uh, maybe we should have called them programmable shader, or I don't know. Um, so I think it's a real name. One of the questions we have in the slide is somewhat related to this, because when you mentioned blurred, it made me think is like my mental association to render script immediately. Um, mm -hmm. Are render script scripts essentially performing the same function that an AGSL script is? Uh, yes, uh, yes, except the fact that render script um, had the concept of intrinsics. So mm. sometimes there was a, a, an, a, an implementation that was specific to the device that was not necessarily running on the GPU. It could run on a DSP or something like that. But, but when render script was created, it was really meant to run on the GPU and you would write shaders. Um, except we used, you know, yet another shading language uh, that was render script, uh, hence the name. So it's, uh, it's the same, but not really. <laughs> uh, all right, so for runtime shader, we need to do two things. We need to write the shader itself. So that's a string and uh, that's is something that's common to pretty much all shading languages, all graphics APIs, you, 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 
you tend to pass your shader as a string, which is both a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because strings are a horrible way to, to write you know, code. Uh, it's also a blessing because you can generate those strings at runtime. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you know, when I implemented uh, Canvas on top of the GPU, a lot of the work was actually creating this generator that based on your paint, on the state mm. of the canvas, on all the inputs, you would like concatenate a bunch of strings together to generate. Like there were like hundreds of thousands of possible combinations. Of Sounds shaders. easy to debug. Uh, yeah, yeah <laughs> it, it, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but, but that's okay, because remember, like you don't have a debugger, so you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, then the problem is yeah. fixed, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I, uh, I, I need to pass this, this string, and then I'm gonna explain as well this uh, this second string here. So uh, let's create a our shader source over here. So there's a really cool feature in Android Studio. Uh, I'm using Flamingo Preview, so I don't know um, I don't know in which, ver which version we added that, but it recognizes that you're typing AGSL. Ooh. And it starts uh, auto, and it will automatically do. Uh, it injects uh, the language. Yeah, yeah, it inject, injects the language. Or at least it was doing. Oh, it was <laughs> doing that yesterday. Why is it complaining here? Did you update to today's version by any chance? I, I did. Aha. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Uh, here we don't pass the string. Here we pass the runtime shader. Uh, so I need to create that runtime shader. So. Uh, one time shader. Okay, and here, oops, and here we pass the string. All right, so see, trick automatically. Ah, okay. Pass, as soon as I pass the string to a runtime shader, Studio knows that this string is is shading, uh, and so it starts uh, doing the syntax scoring. And the other cool thing you can do is if you alt enter, you can go to edit AGSL and give you a separate editor. Nice. And oh, nice. And that is awesome because in Lockcat, if you make a, a so if you have a typo, it will give you a line number inside the shader, and you know when you're inside your string, it's hard to find that that line. So it's going to be a lot easier if you go to that uh, separate. And you can see as I type here, it updates the string uh, up above. Oh, nice. I so, yeah. I love uh, good tooling. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I I didn't know, like I knew that we had syntax color, coloring, but I thought I needed to add my own annotation to make it work. And the fact that it works out of the box is it, it, it used to be that you had to manually inject the GLSL. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so that's not uh, maybe it's in Dolphin. I don't know. So I'm using Flamingo. So that's the current Canary build uh, of Studio. Uh, but I believe it's. Probably, if it's not in Dolphin, it's probably at least in Electric Eel, uh, but don't take my word for it. Uh, you'll, you'll have to go check. Anyway, um, so I'm going to just add a little bit more uh, before I describe what's going on. So we're going to create our main function. Um, in GLSL, that main function would have a different signature, uh, but this is how a GSL works. So a couple of things are, are, are happening here. So first of all, we have our main entry point. So that's the function that's going to be invoked for every pixel that we're going to, that we're going to draw. Uh, and we have a single input. So float2, that's a vector of two floats. Uh, you can have float3, float4. In GLSL, those are called vec. So they are vec2, uh, vec3, vec4. Um, but the way in GLSL, if you want to, to use you know, floats, a 32 bit float or 16 bit float, it's it's kind of um, it's very awkward how you do it. So one of the things that AGSL does is that it gives you two different types. Um, so because in GLSL you would write it this way, you would say hi p vec two foo equals vec two blah, and the half the 16 bit float version would be written like this. Uh, and the part that's annoying is that this is called a precision qualifier. And you can see that it's not part of the type. So on the right hand side, you don't put it. So you can't use defines. Uh, you can't define your own types. Like it wouldn't work. So it's super annoying to use. Uh, so thankfully, the Skia folks uh, did this. So float2, those are the coordinates of your pixel uh, inside the composable. Uh, so we're going to have the x and y coordinates. And this function returns a vector of four 16-bit floats because we return colors, uh, and we don't need 32-bit to represent colors. Uh, even if we are doing like HDR or something like this, 16-bit uh, floats are more than enough. 
so for now, all we're going to do is return a new vector, um, and we're going to return you know, red. Uh, and the order of the colors, by the way, in, uh, in shaders is R, so red, green, blue, alpha. Um, so now, if we run this, um, and I'm going to add, yeah, one more thing I'm going to add is we need to clip our layer, uh, because in Compose, we don't clip by default. So if we run this, we should be seeing red. Uh, where I saw some yeah. text stuff there. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a demo I published on, on Twitter a couple of weeks ago. I was playing with a flowing text around arbitrary shapes. Uh, we can have a uh, we can have a, a stream about that one day once I'm done. Uh, Whenever. I mean, yeah, sure. We can anyway. also have uh, Halil or, or Zach coming back for that. <laughs> Uh, Ale, so yeah. you're welcome to join whenever you want, Ale. You just, <laughs> you just need to say the word. <laughs> so, here it's, so here we have our shader running, right? And we could do something like slightly more interesting. Let's say that the red was like the X coordinate divided by, I don't know, uh, 1024. Uh, it's going to give us a good, like some arbitrary gradient. Uh, here we go. Um, and so that's, you know, in a nutshell, how pixel shaders work, right? You have your inputs. And from the input, you compute the output uh, without knowing anything about the, the, the pixels around you. Uh, but we want to do something more interesting. So what we want to do, actually, in our case, I mentioned we want to do chromatic aberration of an image or, or any composable for that matter. Uh, and that leads us to this. So a uniform uh, in, in the OpenGL world, so in GRSL, SKSL, AGSL, um, is an input that's constant across all the invocations of your pixel shader, right? So all the pixels, you know, we're executing our pixel shader for every single pixel on the screen right here. And that uniform will be a constant for all those pixels. Uh, if we were to, we, we could render twice with the same program and we could change the value of the input, but the value will be the same for like, you know, all the pixels within one invocation uh, one draw call, basically. Um, and, and typically, you know, that's how you would declare like all your inputs uh, for, for your shader. So if I want like extra inputs, like I want to know the size of the composable, uh, so I need the X and Y. If I want to, to know the amount of uh, chromatic aberration, I would just add more inputs. Um, Roman, the, can yeah. I ask you one sec if you can explain sure. the return half four stuff again? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so yeah, I said the main function is to return the color of the pixel uh, as a 16-bit float. So here, all we're doing is we're returning a, a vector of four values. So it's a, to color RGBA. Uh, and so if we set like red to one, green to zero, blue to zero, alpha to one, uh, it's a constructor kind of. But the only things you can construct in a shader are vectors and matrices. Uh, and structs, but uh, that's we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, Let's not get there. <laughs> uh, yeah, and also I, I don't know if a GSL like fully supports them uh, because in in GSL like your your inputs, for instance, you could declare a struct as your input, uh, but then on the call side it becomes more complicated on how to like pass the data. Um, yeah, so we can define inputs this way. Uh, so for instance, if I wanted to pi pass the size of the, the composable to my shader, you know, I would use this like on size changed uh, lambda. And here I would just say like shader set float uniform. You have to specify the name, it's a string. So uh, that's another huge source of errors between shaders. Like there's a lot of like magic strings that you have to declare. Uh, oh, so it sounds like easy. swing. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, oh yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Kotlin. Right. When you do graphics programming in Kotlin and you have to like convert explicitly all the time, it drives me nuts. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so shader here is our runtime shader object, uh, and if I want to set one of those values, you know, I called set something uniform. So in this case, it's floats. Uh, and I just pass it like one to four floats, depending on, on the type that I've defined here. So now I have my size. So now, you know, that gradient that I made arbitrary, now we could do this, and it will give me a gradient from uh, black to red, no matter what the size of the, the composable is, 
it will always give me a value between zero and one uh, and, and it works. Uh, so now we know that our data is passed properly. Uh, but there's this other uniform here that's of type shader. So that is specific to AGSL that does not exist in OpenGL. And it's basically a way to access the output of another shader. Uh, and when I created the runtime shader effect here, you know, I named, I have this string that names this here. So what, what Android's gonna do is because we set the render effect on the graphics layer, it's automatically gonna set on this composable input I have a shader that contains the composable itself. So what I can do is I can effectively read the data, the graphics data from the composable. Uh, so remember, I have an image, right? So instead of returning my own color here, what I can do is composable, oops, uh, uh, composable.eval, and I need to pass the coordinate at which I want to evaluate the shader. So here, all I'm saying is, at this current coordinate, give me the color from this other shader at the same coordinate. And what this is going to, going to give me is our image. Uh, just we're not doing anything, we're not modifying it. Now we could do interesting things like uh, I mentioned that shading languages are graphic specific, so they let you do cool stuff uh, like swizzling. So you can access the individual channel of a vector. So you can use RG, you can type uh, G for green, B for blue, and so on. You can also use XYZ, um, but you don't have to use them in the, the same order, right? So remember I said in the vector, we store red, green, blue, alpha, but I can say that I want blue, green, red, alpha. Uh, so that will return me the, the values from that vector here, just in a different order. And what this will do is, if you look at the image, it should change the colors. Uh, yeah, we, we swap the colors. Or we could do something like, give me only the red and put it in every channel. So now we should have a gray image that only contains the red bits. Uh, of the image, or we could just ditch the blue uh, and keep, you know, and put right in the blue channel and see what happens. There you go. Uh, so shading languages are awesome for this kind of stuff, right? Like they make life so much easier for <laughs> graphics programmers. Uh, I don't know uh, what happened there. We... It's fine. Now it works. Sorry. The yeah. video went okay. away for a second. Sky. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so graphic. So, so shading languages are awesome because this is the kind of stuff you do all the time. And if you ever had to write, you know, uh, this kind of code in Android where you have to, you know, shift your bits to the right and then do masking, pain the ass. Uh, here, like it's all there. And AGSL adds its own uh, features. Uh, you can swizzle with constants. So let's say I want to always set red to to one. I can just type one instead. So we could do GBA. Uh, and now it's going to fix uh, red to one everywhere, and that's what it looks like. Or I could say I want blue to zero. So anyway, it, it looks terrible. It looks like shit, but you know, that's, that's what shaders can do for you. Um, so how do we use that? Um, right now, I'm going to remember this value. We're going to reuse it later. So I have the current, you know, value for my, uh, uh, oh, well, before we do more, uh, let me let me show you an, another example of what you can do uh, with with shaders. So let's say we wanted a real grayscale version of this image. Um, I'm gonna do uh, uh, if we do the dot product of our color with this magic constant. Uh, so I think it's twenty one twenty six. Uh, 752, and I think that's the one. Uh, and if I run that, we should have a black and white version of the image. Oops, I, oh, I type VEC3. I'm used to typing GLSL, but this is, <laughs> this is AGSL, so I have to type float3, not VEC3. Uh, no, I made another mistake. Uh, oh, yes, because, uh, see, I'm, I'm trying to do the dot product of a vector of four components with a vector of three components. So that's not going to work. So thanks to the swizzling in shading languages, you can do that and say, you know what? We're not going to touch the alpha channel. 
Uh, That's really cool. Me the, yeah, the so you can video. assign. Okay. You can also assign to the to the to the components on the left side, which you know again makes life super easy. It's kind of a super fancy uh, destructure and declaration and okay. assignment yeah. thing. Oh, and of course, uh, I can't dot product uh, sixteen bit float with thirty two bit float. So no, okay. <laughs> bring luck, cat. See what's going on. I feel. I feel. I feel you are getting close, but I don't know where. To what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> How do I bring up my log? Okay. Uh, let's see what it says. I'm able to start activity. Okay. Type Probably you are missing the internet permission. That's a classic. <laughs> uh, cannot operate on half three and a half. Uh, what is it talking about? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm done. Uh, so yeah, so the dot product returns a single scalar value. It doesn't return a vector. And GLSL is, or SKSL or HGSL is very much like Kotlin. It doesn't like, um, actually it's worse than Kotlin because it has implicit conversions, but not always. So this is a single value, but here we want to assign it to a vector of three components. So we have to explicitly say, yeah, please replicate the value uh, on on th on all three components. So what you're saying is it's uh, as predictable as JavaScript. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, and, oops, I forgot a zero point a zero dot. So and now it works. Here we go. <laughs> Great scale. First try. Uh, yeah. So first try. <laughs> so see, even with experience, that's the fun part about shaders is that it's very. Easy no, but I mean, but I mean, jokes aside, this thing is quite error prone for the the sake of you know because the, the tooling is very um fragile it feels fragile to me even with a, like a gazillion um a lot of knowledge from your side it's just like you know you can't keep everything in mind from a syntax point yeah. of view from a modeling point of view so you will do this kind of mistakes it's easy to make mistakes, um, but oh, and another cool thing. So I, sh I showed the swizzling, but another cool thing about the way those those types work is, let's say I need to build a vector of four components, right? And here I already have a vector of two components, so I can just pass that vector here and then add the two missing values, uh, and it will work. Uh, or if I had a, if this was a vector of three values, I could just you know pass one missing value and so on. Uh, so it's really cool. Like the language is smart enough to like help you, just you know, to help you build this kind of stuff easier. Uh, anyway, so let's build our chromatic aberration. Uh, so we have our color. Uh, so what we want to do to to do the chromatic aberration, you based on the position on screen. Uh, like I said, you want to see like red or blue fringing. So the way you do this is you want to sample the colors at a different position uh, in the source image, depending on where you are uh, on screen. Uh, it's gonna, so it's gonna be a little more obvious when I start typing the code. So first of all, we need to know how far away we are from the center of the image. Um, and the cool thing is because this is a shading language, uh, we can do like vector math super easily. So if I take the current position of the pixel uh, and I subtract half of the size of the composable that give me a new vector that's basically the vector from my current position to the center of the image. And if I want to know the distance of that, I can just use the built-in function called length. So I'm taking, oops, taking the length of that vector. And now I have the distance to my pixel. Uh, super simple. And again, if we if we wanted to see what it looks like, so that's that's how you debug shaders, right? Like you have your distance, you're not sure what it means. Uh, so we're gonna say, okay, uh, the distance divided by size dot, uh, we're gonna take the max of size dot x and size dot y. And if I run that, it should give us a gradient that, show us, that shows us, uh, no, I messed up something. So why is that not working? Um, See, that's a, a great example of, let's try with an alpha value. Ah, here we go. Uh, so you can see like it's black in the center. So distance is zero of the center and there's this light, like there's this circular gradient. So the further away mm -hmm. we are from the center, the bigger the distance. Uh, so, so we know that, you know, that code we just wrote 
works. And what I just showed you is how you debug pixel shaders. Just make it uh, so red. <laughs> you have to become very creative with visualization. Uh, you mm. have to find creative ways of visual, visual, visualizing stuff. Um, all right. So uh, then, let's see. Uh, so now that we have the distance uh, to the to the to the center, we want to we want to use that to inform how many pixels by how many pixels do we want to shift the the red red green and blue channels uh, to get the chromatic aberration so we're gonna oops ah so that the distance is in pixel coordinates right so it can be a a, a large value like at the edges i don't know it's going to be something like 512 or 1024 uh, but we don't want to shift our image by that much we want to shift by like you know maybe 50 pixels or something like this so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the distance divided by the max of the size, and we're going to multiply by an amount, and that amount will come from uh, the UI. So I'm going to add a, let's see where I'm going to put that. Uh, I need uh, something to remember. So the chromatic amount equals number. Table state of. Uh, we're going to do. All right, then I need a slider. I'm adding some padding because otherwise the uh, back gesture <laughs> areas are going to get in the way. Uh, uh, right. Yes, uh, so chromatic amount of value and on value change, uh, gonna do tick amount of value, of value. Uh, we need a value range, uh, so let's say to 150, okay. Uh, and then we need to set that that, that 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 value that we have the chromatic amount. We need to pass it to the shader, you know, as a uniform. Uh, so I'm going to put that here. Set float uniform. Uh, the name is amount and chromatic amount that value. Okay. Uh, and again, if we want to to test, uh, we could return here amount divided by our max Oops. no f shaders All right will that work All right so my slider and yeah okay we're passing our value properly and now we can use it All right so let's go back to what we had Okay, so I have this displacement. So I'm taking, I'm basically normalizing the distance to the center. I want a value between zero and one, mm -hmm. and then I'm multiplying it by uh, this value here that tells me, okay, how how much displacement do we actually want in pixels? So now that we have that, uh, I can do color equals uh, half four. Uh, actually, you know what? Color dot RGB equals half three. We're going to preserve the alpha channel. Uh, and because we want to displace the color channels, uh, we have to evaluate again our, our source composable. And we're going to take the original coordinates, but we're going to modify them. So here I'm going to shift the red channel uh, to the left and to the, to the bottom. And I'm going to take only the red channel. For the green channel, we're going to keep the original value. Uh, actually, we could. Yeah. And for the blue channel, we're going to shift, but to the right and to the top. So, record plus displacement. And here again, you can see a cool feature of shading languages where this is a vector of two coordinates. Uh, and I'm subtracting a single float. So, it's going to subtract the same float. It's the equivalent of saying this, right? It's going to apply the subtraction to both components uh, of the. Uh, uh, but if I want to displace only horizontally, then I could I could do this, for instance. So it really depends on what what effect you're trying to build. Uh, and the last step uh, is remember that in on Android, uh, if the image or the composable that we are uh, that we are modifying has an alpha channel, is not completely opaque. Uh, Android wants 
uh, free multiplied alpha. Uh, do I need to? Um, I think I may need to do this, or maybe not. I'm not sure. Or pre multiply. Right, and if I run that, I think here we go. Aha! Uh -huh. See that you know, if I increase the amount of chromatic aberration, you can see especially at the edges that we're starting to shift. So cool. You need better lenses, Roman. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And now comes the fun part about you know shaders and graphics programming. Like what I don't like about this effect is like we computed the distance, but it's a linear distance, right? So the effect is applied like from the center. So like when you have a large amount of chromatic aberration, like the whole image almost like gets affected. Uh, so that's where you start doing you know. What I call it's like uh, it's it's turning around on a on a on a sphere or something. Is it yeah. just my impression on Skype or is it uh, actually happening? Yeah, no, so it's 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 based on the distance, so it's gonna it's gonna radially like yeah, it expands like you know or in in, a, in circular directions. Um it's almost smoothen, it's like yeah? you you zoomed you you took the com the the red component and the blue component of the image and you scale them up essentially. Yeah, they're shifted actually. We just move them to other pixels. Right. Um, but instead of remember what I said at the beginning, like about pixel shaders, we can't move the channel. Instead, is every pixel is like, oh, actually, my red is the red from that other pixel. So you gather instead of scattering. Um, anyway, so yeah, the change I made here, I took I took our normalized distance and I applied a power, like I raised it to the power of two. Uh, and the only difference it makes is that it it changes like we go from linear uh, a linear distance to uh, to an exponential one, and we can see that we better preserve the center. So now the effect is only you know visible at the edges, uh, and of course you could play with that as much as you want to to find out like you know what what looks good to you. So here we preserve even more and it makes the effect a little more subtle. Uh, so and looks a bit more think. like it would look on a physical lens. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, you know. And and that part, like you know, there's no right way or wrong way of doing it. It's just fuck around until it looks good. <laughs> Is that graphics in a nutshell? <laughs> that, that's that's pretty much graphics in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, and um, and the cool thing, like with this whole system, is that. It would it it will work with you know any composable right because it's applied as a graphics layer so you don't have to put an image in there you could put like a, a button or a piece of text like it won't necessarily look good uh, but you know it will work with pretty much anything uh, and as you can see like you know shaders are fairly simple um, and with just like this amount of code like we have this you know running on the GPU and super fast and and it's really yeah. neat. And then you start, you open up Shader Toy and start start looking at weird shaders. They're like, what? <laughs> What's going yeah, on? Yes. But, but at the same time, you know, yeah, Shader Toy shaders are, are very impressive. But when I see them, I, I'm impressed, of course, but I also know that it's mostly tedious. I mean, you have a programming language, right? So you, you can recreate pretty much anything. It's just, you can print text from a shader. It's extremely painful to do so, but you can do it. Uh, so everything can be done. It's just a major pain in the ass, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, you can use shaders to generate stuff from zero as well. I think that has be uh, yeah has to be remarked. Yeah, and, and, and actually, you know, we, we can switch to shader to, and we can start building something cool from zero uh, if you're interested. Um, the, so a couple of things about shaders. Again, they run on the GPU, wide gamut of devices. So optimizing them is always a good thing. Uh, so here's this, there's a very simple example of I'm raising this value to the power of two. Cool. Uh, that's also called a square uh, multiplication, right? So instead of calling this power function, that's actually pretty expensive on the GPU. What if I just build a square function that takes, uh, oops, actually, no, it's a, it's a Float that takes a value and just returns the square. Uh, now it will do the same thing, except it will be cheaper, so it will run faster. There you go, same, same visual effect. Uh, here I'm using length, so I, I don't know if you remember your math, but the 
the length of a vector is the square root of the square uh, of the distance. So it squares, it squares the components and then it does the square root. But the square root is expensive on the GPU, especially because on GPU, on GPUs, uh, square root is actually implemented as the as one divided by the inverse of the square root. Uh, so you're doing a division, a square root, which is expensive. Uh, but we're only doing a distance, so we don't have to compute the length. Uh, we could compute the square distance, so you can do that with a dot product. Uh, and I guess I can remove my square here. And now, uh, instead, I'll take the square of the max dimension. And that should give me the same thing. Oops. Uh, I have. Are you John here. Carmacking this now or? <laughs> uh, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Let's see, uh, cannot operate, division cannot operate on float. Uh, why can't you operate on a float? What the fuck is wrong with you? Uh, <laughs> I don't need that different displacement. I think it's the no first match. one. Oh, no match, there's no, what? I think no it's saying there? that it cannot operate on invalid and float. So I think yeah, the first no, one is. The, the, the real error is that it's telling me, oh yeah, of course. Uh, you, a dot product, you do a dot product of a, of a vector with another vector. So uh, we're going to code that, I don't know, uh, direction. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, doing the dot product like this, uh, the dot product is only going to do like uh, tier X uh, times tier X plus tier Y times tier Y. Uh, it's the same thing as writing this, uh, mm. just a shorthand. So it gives me the square distance. All right, so now, that should work. Yay. And still the same effect, except we're not doing a power function, which is expensive, and we're not doing a square root, which is also expensive. Uh, so optimizing shaders often boils down to this kind of tricks, right? Like I didn't really care about the distance. I just wanted something that, that I could normalize to tell me by how much I want to shift things. Um, so yeah, it's a... Uh, it's fun. Uh, I like doing this kind of stuff. And then, and then GPUs also have a lot of tricks that you know you need to learn about. Like for instance, this is basically free. Uh, so we're reading from this float two called size, and turns out because multiplying by a quarter, half, two, four, eight is a very common thing to do in graphics programming. GPUs are able to do this in the instructions, in the load instructions. So this wow. time zero point five does not count it's free um there's also like if i was doing uh let's say this i was taking the negative that's also free because the gpus can take the negative at load time or the you know if i take the absolute value that's also free if i take the absolute value of half of the vector that's also free uh so there's also there's a lot of cool stuff like this uh so it, at some point it becomes a bit it's a bit of witchcraft, and you know, it's hard <laughs> to find information about these kind of tricks. Uh, but yeah, th there are a lot of things you can do. Um, by by far, the most expensive expensive thing we're doing here is is this that we do three times, and we don't have a choice, right? Because we're shifting, we need values at different mm. locations in the image. Uh, but that is the kind of stuff you want to avoid uh, as much as possible because that's you know. That's going to be expensive reading so from the tech look, or even lookups worse. are lookups are expensive in general. Uh, yeah, reading from a texture is expensive, uh, and in this case, like maybe we're even executing another shader. I, I'm not even sure how it, mm. how Skia does it. Uh, probably depends on the, the shader itself, but yeah, that that, that can be expensive. Um, oh, and another fun fact: uh, GPUs again are not CPUs. They don't have the concept of functions, so all your code gets in line. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you create a, a, a separate function that gets in line anyway. Uh, so it's free uh, to call that function. Uh, it's, it, that function does not exist. It's only for you. Okay. Um, we have about 25 minutes. I mean, we can go long if you want. Uh, I don't have anything to, <laughs> to do. Uh, uh, do, do you want to uh, do you want to to try to write a shader toy for fun to see like what kind of crazy stuff sure. you can do? I I was I have, uh, a, I have a question before me we move on. Yeah, please. So, <laughs> uh, 
could you use this in animations? I mean, could the the thing that you are doing with the slider? Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Make, could you the, make an the, animation out of it? Something like this? Uh, yeah, because and, I think and, the slider is providing you like a value, right? And then you are calling the shader over and over and over. So yeah, would and, you be able to automate it like, you know, like animate value in Compose, something like that? Will it work? I yeah, yeah it, would, it would totally work. And actually, you know, a lot of visual effects that you see in games are just those uniforms getting animated over time. Or sometimes what, what we do a lot, and we can see that in Shader Toy, sometimes you will even pass the time you know, as a fraction, like the like the, 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 the current fraction of the current second that just gives you a value that changes all the time. Uh, and then based on that, like, let's say we did, uh, I don't know, you know, here we would take like the sign of the time and then you would, you know, and, if, and then in my compose code, if I were to set a value here, it would automatically start doing something interesting with the okay. amount of displacement. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty common thing to do. Thanks, thanks. So uh, I uh, while you were explaining this stuff, I I actually started looking up because uh, I, I remember the website where there's a bunch of SDF examples, uh, yeah, and I think it's worth yeah worth talking about that maybe. Yes, l l let's build an SDF. So let me <laughs> are you let ready? <laughs> let me start my my uh, let me start a new shader toy, and then we can uh, new okay. So, and I need to share that uh, with Skype, share, 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 uh, this one. Okay. <laughs> can you see my screen? Uh, I can still see studio. Okay. Now it updated. Perfect. Okay. So share the toy, very similar concept, closer it's GLSL. Uh, you can see that we have a main function. It gives you the current coordinate of the pixel, just like we like we had with the GSL, uh, but instead of returning the color, uh, it gives us the color as an output parameter. So anything we write in that variable will be the color of the pixel, and you can see that what it's doing by default, uh, it takes the the current coordinates divided by the resolution. Uh, so in Shader Toy, all the things that start with I are inputs that are set for you. So there's a bunch of them. You have access to the time, to the current frame, to the mouse button, stuff like that. Um, so it's going to normalize the, the coordinates. So we have values between 0 and 1. Uh, and then it computes a color based on time. Uh, and that's why you're seeing this like changing colors. Uh, and again, it's a good example of like the cool stuff you can do with shaders, right? Um, but uh, let's build something more interesting. So. Uh, we're gonna start. We're gonna keep this uh, UV. Uh, I'm gonna let's see. Um, Is it UV in the sense of uh, texture space? Yeah. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, usually in shaders, we use RGB for colors, XY for screen coordinates or vector coordinates. And UV is. Uh, you can also like here. I could type UV. That also works in GLSL. Uh, we reserve them for texture space, or in that case, you know, if you if we imagine that the viewport is a texture, it, it's like normalized coordinates, so between zero and one, or minus one and one. That's that's a common thing to do. Uh, okay, so we're gonna keep that, but now I want to draw something more interesting uh, than you know than cover the whole screen. So we're gonna use something that's called sign uh, distance field. Uh, and let's see, we're going to do, how we're going to do this. Uh, create a function that takes our coordinates. Uh, la, 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 la. Okay, I hate the shader toy editor because not all, uh, all the typical uh, keyboard shortcuts work and makes things very... Uh, Is the Skia playground better? Uh, I think it might be, yeah. Uh, but the problem is that it uses a different coordinate space, so I don't want to mess with my brain too much. All right. So the, the idea of, of sign distance field is that you can generate complex scenes or shape just based on on equations that, that give you a, di a distance. Like given a coordinate, 
a sign distance field would tell you how far you are from that shape, right? Um, and a, a very simple example that's easier to understand is the circle. So if I give a position, you know, in the world, and I know the radius of my circle, we can compute the distance from that position to the circle uh, by doing the length of the position minus the radius. Mm. And the a distance field will be negative when you're inside the shape. It will be zero when you're at the, at the edge of the shape, and it will be positive when you're away from the shape. So from that definition of a circle, um, and actually I'm going to also create, uh, to make things easier to understand, uh, I want a translation function. The problem is because we think in distances, we are not thinking in peaks, in coordinates anymore. Uh, when you want to do, for instance, a translation, so let's say I have a, a position P and I want to translate by, by T, you're not going to do P plus T, you're going to do P minus T uh, because we have, we're flipping things around. Um, so don't think about it too much, but, you know. Yeah, just to uh, give so, it simple. Yeah. So <laughs> let's, cre let's create a circle. Uh, we're going to take our position uh, and we're going to work in, in screen coordinates. That's going to be easier. Uh, we're going to put it, I don't know, at, uh, like somewhere here. Uh, translate. Wait, uh, how many parentheses do I have? Uh, uh, there we go. And I need to give my, ra my circle radius. So now if I return that circle, and I go back to here. So now in my, my shapes variable, I have the distance to the shape. Um, and uh, I call that color. Um, just setting things up. All right. Uh, and, and now I want to, to draw that shape. So I'm going to take the mix, so mix is a linear interpolation. Uh, it's also called LERP. Uh, you may have seen that before. And I'm going to go between colors or black. So that's going to be our background. And fill color, this weird like plasma thing. And I'm going to pass our distant fill function. And if I run that, OK. So you can see there's a circle here. Trippy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, so but we have negative values. We're painting instead of painting the outside of the circle black, we're painting the outside uh, with colors. Uh, and that's because, again, we're working with distances. So I'm going to use a helper function uh, called fill mask and fill mask. Go uh, to fill mask X. Uh, let's see. Uh, trying to remember because I always get those wrong. Uh, yes, we're going to return the negative and we're going to clamp it. So clamping, uh, that's just to, co in Kotlin, that's called coerce. Uh, so in GLC, we call that clamp. It's going to, if the value is less than zero, it's going to be zero. If it's more than one, it's going to be one. Uh, and then if I run that, there we go. And that's it. Now we have a circle <laughs> that has a nice animation. <laughs> Now, if we were to zoom on the circle, uh, it's not going to be properly uh, properly anti-aliased. Uh, so instead of this fill mask, we can use another function that we're going to call anti-alias mask. Uh, okay, and we're going to do something similar, but uh, so we still need to invert, and we're going to get the smooth step zero uh, and x. So what this does is given a value X, uh, it's going to apply some kind, it's an interpolation, but it's not linear. It, it's, a, it's a curve, it's kind of like an S curve. It's a nicer interpolation. Uh, and that, uh, oops, not smooth step, smooth step, <laughs> step. I, I always, I don't know why I always type that. Anyway, so now it's hard to see, but now our circle is entirely S. But now the cool thing is we can build a scene with that. So I have a circle, how about I, I put a second circle? Uh, so we're going to put it somewhere else. Let's say 840, uh, I don't know, like uh, 50 different radius. Um, but the question is, how do I combine those two circles? So for that, 
gonna say, okay, we're gonna start with circle one and I'm gonna create another function, add to scene, uh, circle two. So the cool thing with, with distance fields is because they are, their distances, it doesn't matter if it's the distance to the circle or to anything else in the scene, right? Like it could be, it could be any other shape or it could be many different shapes. So our add to scene uh, is going to, uh, I'm trying, yeah, okay, yeah, it's the mean, uh, load A, B, um, turn mean A, B, and that, if I remember correctly, there we go, we have two circles. Uh, and then what's interesting with distance field is that if you do the max, it's going to take the intersection. And then there's a bunch of other operators you can find online, but you can easily like merge uh, shapes together uh, as blobs. Uh, it's, it's really, really cool. And here we're not doing any ray tracing or ray marching or anything fancy, right? It's just, hey, given the current, the coordinates of the current pixel, am I inside a circle or how far am I, am I for a circle? And just based on that, we are, we're computing everything else. Um, now let's add some rounded rectangles, uh, and that one, I wrote it down somewhere because I always forget the math for it. So we need the position, we need the size, we need the radius of the corners. And, uh, let me look it up. Uh, where did I put it? Ah, yeah. So it's the, so bear with me. It's the, uh, the max, uh, the absolute value of p minus size plus the radius, and, and I think that, oops, syntax error. Uh, let's see, I forgot the parentheses. There we go. So now here in my scene, I can create uh, rounded rect, p v2 uh, for the radius, Something like this. I'm gonna put this one in bottom left. Uh, uh, oh yeah, I forgot the size. So I want size to be the same. Okay, and now I can combine my rectangle with my distance field. This one, I have a rectangle. Nice. Add, yeah, we're going to add another one. Yeah, distance fields are fun. And they work in 3D as well. Uh, they are a little more complicated in 3D because I think someone mentioned in the chat, like you have to do what's called ray marching. And if we have time, we may see some ray marching here to do something really, really pretty. Um, but, the, uh, but the idea is the same. Right? Like you just have functions that give you the distance to, uh, to a 3D surface instead of a, of a 2D surface. Uh, so you know i'm i'm genuinely happy that we have a time box like a, a finite amount of time because I, i'm wondering how long will it take to reach like ray tracing kind of shit? <laughs> and it's like okay we need a 4090 because this thing is not running anymore on my machine um mm -hmm. so just saying. I mean, if we need to buy the the graphic cards, Roman, just just tell us, right? I mean, we can <laughs> business expense them. Next episode, we we need something beefer. Uh, and let's see. Now, I also want to have a more interesting background. Uh, let's see, we're gonna. So, what I want to do for the background? So, here in Shader Toy, you can you have a bunch of pre-built textures. So let's say we're just going to put that texture in the background. Uh, and so we're going to do something similar to what we just did in, in Compose. Uh, so we want the UV coordinates, the position of the pixel, and background color. All right. So uh, first, I'm going to sample from that background. So in, you know, we used eval in, in Compose, uh, in GLSR, you use texture and you pass the name of the texture. So here it's called I channel zero. Uh, then I'm gonna take the luminance of that. So that's the, the numbers we, we used before. Uh, uh, I should have written them down. Uh, All the magic numbers. 
<laughs> yes, all the magic numbers. They, they don't matter that much, but you know, it's nice to be uh, to be correct. Uh, 252 and 0 0.0722, yes. Uh, so here we're just taking the, uh, the grayscale version of the background uh, and we're gonna multiply that by the background color to do some tinting. Uh, and we may want to, let's see what that does. Uh, return color. Okay, it's hard to see, but uh, yeah, if I see. Yeah, it's, it's there uh, in the background. Um, and if you want to keep going, we can add lights to make it lights. very pretty. Yeah. Uh, okay. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, so I'm telling you, it's just a matter of time. <laughs> yeah, so, so for that, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead. Like I, I, I'm going to copy paste some code because that one is more complicated. Uh, oh, yeah, that stuff. Yes. Yes, thank so, you. <laughs> bam. So you okay. know, a bit of code. Uh, and Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to copy the rest because otherwise it's going to take forever. Uh, let's see. Uh, OK, I think, I think that should be it. Ah, easy peasy. <laughs> uh, yes, kill. All oh, right. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is going? Oh, wait, 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 wait! You're moving the thing? Yeah. Oh, for fuck's sake! Uh, and we're gonna Surprise. go through that in, in a little bit. But, but first, we need to make it prettier uh, because here we're we're handling colors completely oh. wrong. Uh, so let me grab. A couple of functions. Uh, I'm gonna put them here. Uh, I didn't even know that you could click the thing. <laughs> and now you can even drag stuff. It's, it's too bright uh, because I need to bring down the fucking background. Uh, let's see. Up. Oh. Up. Oh. All right, that's better. All right, there we go. Uh, you know, we have nice lighting and shadows. Uh, it's trying hell? to emulate also like. The lighting on the edges, like I'm, I'm so uh, yeah. remember, like I, I talked about, we have those distance fields, uh, and they're negative inside the shapes. So I'm doing something interesting here, where we, for pixel, when a pixel is inside the shape, I find the direction to the to one of the lights, I compute the distance to the light, and then I'm I'm basically marching along that direction to find like where is the surface of the shape, like when do I get out of the shape. And that tells me how far inside the shape I am. So then like this, this shading you see inside is based on the distance to the, to the edges of the shape. So like when the, the light moves closer, yeah. you can see that the light propagates more inside and when yeah. it's further away. So it's basically like absorbing the light inside the shape. Yeah. Um, like if you would use like a flashlight on, you know, you know, my, my baby loves when, when he does with the flashlight. So it will be the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, so, I, I just want to be sure because people are, are asking in the chat and so so you can run this same thing as it is on Android. You just so do the... you you could uh, but <laughs> just to be clear, this code here is very expensive. <laughs> okay, but what do you mean expensive? I mean you're running it on a on a laptop and probably that's I'm running it into a laptop. But it's running at a fairly low resolution. Uh, if I were to go full screen uh, on, you know, I have a, like 6K display, like with the Mac OS scaling and so on, like you would start, the frame rate would start dropping pretty heavily. Okay, uh, okay. And you can see it's running Because at of the code, the code performance. Yeah. Because it's, yeah. it could be improved. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, because like with distance fields, what happens at, uh, so remember, so we computed the distance field here once uh, to, to fill the shapes, right? But then what I didn't show is that when we apply a light, um, so when you when you apply a light here, the light also also needs to uh, uh, where's the shadow um, illumination. So the, the light, for each light we call this illumination function, and okay. the illumination function itself there's a loop that can run up to forty eight times. So that's what's called ray marching, and for every step it's going to compute the distance of the entire scene again. 
So for every okay. light, we have three lights. We can do up to 40, 48 times the scene. And then to compute the inside lighting of the shapes, I'm doing the same thing again. So, you know, we are running like thousands of times, yeah. like we're going through the, and, and the more objects you add to the scene, obviously the more complex this becomes uh, yeah. and the more expensive it becomes. Um, so typically, I mean, it's cute for, uh, f you know, on Shader Toy to like have cool examples of what can be done, but you know, that's probably not the kind of production code you would write. Yeah. Okay. Um, or you would like, but you know, so cool. maybe one light or, or, but, but the point yeah. is, you know, even in compose, if you wanted to do like a cool, like rounded rectangle with like, you know, fancy gradient inside, you can draw the rounded rectangle yourself, like by doing what I just did with just this function you have the distance uh and then you can you know apply whatever cool visual effects you want inside um yeah. and uh, just uh just on that topic uh i put earlier a link in the chat to a website that has a very big collection of sdfs that you can just essentially copy paste yeah. and use uh that's a nice thing uh, you don't have to <laughs> understand how it works too much no but you you but can just get the the parts that you care about and just combine them as we've seen in the in the initial shader, you can just add them and then... Yeah, and for those of you who don't know Shader Toy... Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the kind of shit you can generate. <laughs> okay, but, again, but I... And it's interesting because, you know, here, like, I, I, I have a good idea of, like, how it's done, right? Like, the, the face is a sphere that was deformed, so are the eyes. And there's a lot of, like, again, it's, it's pretty... It's very impressive. But it's also very tedious to be able to write. Like, there's a lot of code uh, to do this, uh, so you can do it. <laughs> you just have to be patient. And it's also running at eight frames per second on a very oh, yeah. powerful GPU. Yeah, my, it's killing my laptop right now. But you know, all those examples are like all things you can do. Uh, you can do in or in Compose with a GSL. Like it's the same mm -hmm. idea. Uh, like here's another example of like distance fields in 3D. Uh, because why not? So, <laughs> ch chances are that if this thing is running smoothly on your laptop, is because the resolution of the window is small and the laptop is like powerful. But yeah. chances are that the the code, the average code that you will find here, it wouldn't scale to higher resolutions and you know complex scenes. Am I yeah. right? And, and here, like, you know, I tried to, it's trying to compile and load, like, uh, people who recreate Doom inside shaders. Uh, and my whole web browser uh, just started hanging. Uh, and I may have to kill it because it's too much yeah. for my laptop. So, yeah, those are awesome. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> they're not exactly, yeah. again, the kind of stuff you should run on the phone uh, in your UI. Uh, but the GPUs can do it. You know, it's a matter of resolution and how, how complex your shader is or how optimized it is. Uh, there's a lot of aspects to this. Uh, oh, yeah, crashed. Did you uh, did you have GLSL in uh, OpenGL ES one? Uh, no, so GLSL uh, was added to OpenGL ES two, mm. and then there's a number of features that were added in in GL in OpenGL ES three and so on. Like do you and so do on you remember three. which version was GL uh, OpenGL ES two added into uh, Android? I mean. Uh, that was, I don't remember, but that was quite early. Maybe that was Android 2.0 or something. Yeah, there must have been Android 2.0 when we we had shaders. It was around that time. Uh, so it's, and even OpenGL ES3 is like API, I don't know, 17 or something like this. Someone in the chat was asking if we can do, like, have these shaders in Gingerbread. It's like, yeah, technically in GLSL, yes, then, uh, but not in... Uh, AGSL, obviously, because you cannot back yeah. that. Uh, yeah, but the, the problem you're going to run into is that, you know, the, uh, the the GPUs back then were super limited. Like when I first implemented uh, Canvas on, on the GPU, so what the, on the Tegra 2, I think at 60 frames per second, I could do reading from one texture, maybe multiplying a matrix in a vector, and that was it. Wow. Uh, they were not powerful GPUs. Like modern GPUs are even even on a, even on Android, like are super powerful. Like you know, uh, I saw someone mentioned filament, uh, which is not really to a GSL, <laughs> but like the, the shaders we run in filament are, are very complex, right? Like they are hundreds of thousands of lines of code, and they run pretty well. Uh, but you know, 
because we're careful about how it's written and, and what we do in them. It's a huge, huge topic, and there's so much that we can talk about. I mean, we can also have another uh, session of let's create a random shader, and maybe we can take suggestions and see if we can, because <laughs> uh, there's so much to talk about, even just, yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing, you know, is, is shaders, again, like it's, they're pretty scary because when you look at them, especially on, 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 uh, on Shader Toy, it's really hard to understand the code, but there are two reasons. One is sometimes there are techniques that you just need to like sit down and learn them. Like uh, the demo I just showed, like I was using remarching. It's not that complicated, but when you don't know how the technique works, yeah, you look at the code and it, it, it feels like gibberish. Mm. But then there's also a lot of, like I said, you know, fake it till you make it, right? Like it's random numbers, random equations that you slap together until it looks good. Uh, it's, it's procedural programming. Um, and a lot of it is going to be like you start from like something that's noise and then you stretch it in one direction and then you blur it and then you apply like a gradient and boom, you've created something that looks like wood. Uh, but someone looking at the code would be like, why? Like, how did you know yeah. how to do that? It's like, ah, I fucked around until it worked. Uh, <laughs> we go back to the, <laughs> the foundational principle of graphics. Yeah, no, yeah, very much so. Uh, and it's interesting because now there are entire tools, uh, like in the, the, the game and 3D industry, there's this tool called Substance Designer. There's Uncharted games, pretty much all the textures were created with that. And it's basically shader toy for designers, but in, with, uh, with the purpose of creating textures. So instead of writing code, you have like blocks, let's say you have a noise block and a blur block and you have a circle block and you connect them together and you're just procedurally building on those functions to like generate something, you know, amazing textures that look like uh, trees. And of course, or... of course, Adobe bought them. <laughs> and of course, yeah, of course, Adobe bought them, but, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. And, and it's very interesting, like, you know, to, to even like install those tools, like just to see like, how those textures get created because then you know in, in, under the hood it just generates shaders actually uh, that that's all it's doing uh, but what's really fascinating is seeing you know all those designers or like shader authors who can think that way right like they see a rock texture and in their mind they're like oh obviously you know i will take like a noise that has this shape and i will transform it in that way and then eventually it'll get me to uh to, to what i want but <laughs> what's really impressive like some folks you know I've seen shader, I've seen textures made with Substance Designer where the texture generates a CD, you know, because again, it's, it's kind of like shaders. So people are, go crazy and they do like amazing things uh, with the, like this kind of procedural generation. So uh, do we want to go through the Slido questions we still have and then wrap uh, up? Yeah. Ivan, see. do you want to do the honors or should I? Uh, please uh, do because sorry. I'm I'm yeah, juggling yeah. the rest. No, yeah, sure. and drinks. just just real quick, I want to show uh, sure yeah, example like from the, the Substance website. Uh, if you can see my window, so those are examples of textures like all those things. They're Whoa. created exactly okay. the way, you know. We just wrote the two shaders that that we wrote uh, on the stream, and they look freaking amazing. Uh, yeah, that's so cool. And because it's still like, like this, like, you know, it's really like people recreate like fiber or like fabric and, yeah. you know, crazy patterns and, uh, yeah. Uh, wood. Some of them oh, are, there is a, there is a whole section for wood. There's different yeah. kinds of wood. <laughs> yeah, there there's, like a, a, there's a lot of types of wood. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. It's like a thousand yeah. something. Wow, this is so cool. Um, anyway, so. So uh, let me see. I, I don't think we have too much time because I know Ivan has to run in a few minutes, but let's yes. answer the most upvoted questions. Um, first one is from Priyank. Are there any beginner's guides on shaders in the context of Android or any beginner's guide uh, that an Android developer can understand? So in the context of Android, Probably not uh, that I know of, at least. Uh, but you know, there's there's not much that's very specific to Android. On developer.android.com, we do have a couple of guides that explain the differences between AGSL and GLSL. 
and the list of functions available in the GSL. Mm -hmm. So if you find guides about GLSL or shaders in general, then you can use what's on, on developer.android.com to like, close the gap. Uh, there is something called the book of shaders, I think online, mm -hmm. uh, that I remember being pretty good to learn about this kind of stuff. Uh, but you know what, what's gonna really help you, because again, the language itself is pretty simple. It's really about like, you know, remembering your math and getting creative. So the best thing to do is to just mess around and try stuff. Uh, also go to Shader Toy and you know, look at examples of how people do things and start. And what's nice that there's always the source code of every Shader Toy, so you can start messing with it uh, to understand how it works, or you can modify it like, you know, yeah. it's, uh, it's really the best. A very thing. useful thing that I found was that if you go on Shader Toy, some have a YouTube video attached where they go into detail exactly why yeah. they're doing every single step. Uh, and. Uh, Including the one with the selfie girl that we saw earlier, I think that also has a video tutorial attached. Oh, and uh, and speaking of which, uh, there was a yeah. No, I was thinking that there's a demo I, I wrote for was it Ideas or Google I/O where I use shaders and I generated a, a real time uh, sky. Uh, let me paste that paste that in the chat. Yeah, that uh, th that's also an interesting. Sh it's also an interesting shader. Uh, and so I was disappointed because most people seem to be like, yeah, sure, like there's the sky. I'm like, but but it's the sky with the real time position of the sun based on the actual time <laughs> and the location in the world, and it's it's physically correct, and ah, you don't understand. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, you can do really really neat things, uh, and that's an example of like you know putting a shader, except it was going through filament because we didn't have the the AGSL shaders yet, uh, but it was showing like, hey, here's what you can do if you use this kind of, of Programming techniques mixed with 2D UI, you can do like really cool stuff, you know, to make your UI more interesting and appealing. Uh, last question: uh, OpenGL on Android uh, has Java API wrapper provided by the SDK. Vulkan is suggested to be used entirely with the NDK, which adds complexity. Why okay, so, is that so? So it's funny because if you think that when you use Vulkan, the complexity comes from JNI. Uh, I would say you have not tried Vulkan yet, uh, <laughs> and and there's a there's a major reason for that. Vulkan is a low level graphics API, and it's extremely powerful. If you know what you're doing, you can get like more out of the GPU and the driver, but it's very complex, uh, and it re it requires a good understanding of the GPUs. Uh, and honestly, like the benefits of using Vulkan would be negated if we give you a Java, Java bindings for it. Uh, because you would go through JNI, which is expensive because of the allocations, because you would have to go through NIO buffers. So it's kind of, it's counterproductive uh, to, to, to expose Vulkan. Now, what would make sense is an API may be built on top of Vulkan uh, that, would, that we would expose at the Java or Kotlin level. Uh, but you know, that would hide some of that complexity. You mean like here. filament? Uh, filament or even or even something like inside filament, there's something we call the backends. It's a it's an abstraction because filament supports OpenGL, Vulkan, WebGL, and Metal. So we have an abstraction, you know, horrible name, it's called backend, and it's kind of like our own graphics API. Uh, so it sits somewhere, it's above all those graphics APIs, but it's below filament, and that's probably like the kind of layer that would be nice to expose uh, to Java uh, as opposed to Vulkan. Got it. OK, so there's other questions. I think we can, uh, I don't know. I don't think we have time to run through them. So uh, I have time if you want, but up to you. Yeah, but it... it's me. It's <laughs> okay. not you, it's me. Oh, who cares about your host? Yeah, we're, we're losing Ivan and uh, but yeah, I mean, a... we can we can also keep the questions for next time, or yeah. <laughs> whatever you want. Ace. Okay, it sounds like a January thing then. <laughs> uh, perfect. And maybe we can also have a stream about filament because someone was asking for it, and I think it would also be interesting to understand the different roles that filament plays in the, in the yeah. ecosystem, which is fairly fairly distinct. Yeah, and I uh, sure we can look at the shaders of Filament. Yeah, I mean, 
sounds uh, risky, but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> they're actually, oddly enough, they're less scary than than what we just saw on Shadow Toy because A, it's, uh, you know, documented with like proper variable names, uh, but also it, it doesn't try to do like, it's not, it's not art, right? It's not an art installation. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's more code, but it's less scary than, than, than Shadow Toys. Okay, so um, Ivan, do you want to do the quick wrap up and then we can yes. see people in the after show uh, for those that are on the Discord, we'll have the link there shortly. Yes, so thank you for all the support. Uh, we have a lot of returning subscribers, so thank you. Thank you a lot for the support. Uh, you can find the uh, um, stickers either at conferences or on our uh, coffee store. Uh, you can say, oh, come on, Mark. <laughs> puede, puede, puede comprar los stickers en, en el, uh, whatever, nos, nos ropa, whatever. Come on, I'm trying. Uh, but jokes aside, um, you can buy the T-shirt on the store. You can support the, the stream um, free if you have an Amazon uh, Prime subscription. Just link it with your Twitch account. And Roman, thank you, thank you a lot for for coming. Yeah, uh, I, I got I got quite an amount of things, so I'm very proud of myself, and I'm also very happy that you were able to explain things in a very <laughs> very very uh, five year uh, five years old uh, way. Um, so thank you again, Sebastian. I think thank I'm you done. very much as well, uh, Roman, and uh, yeah, see you on the other side. And oh yeah, by the way, next week again, reminder, we are off because I am at ADS in London. Uh, but the week after, the week after is going to be cool because we have Rahul talking about baseline profiles. Nice. And uh, that's also a very interesting topic that is, uh, I was actually look, uh, watching his uh, talk from the last ads earlier today so i'm i'm getting ready for it i have so many questions already <laughs> so see you in a couple of weeks have a great one bye ciao ciao bye